Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Standard and we're going to deviate from our usual programming today to talk a bit about a programming technique that I found to be very helpful in this project we've been working on, which is making illegal states unrepresentable in your code. And specifically, we're going to do this in order to address some n plus one and other arithmetic errors that have been very frustrating to track down inside this library that we're developing. Now, you've probably heard of the idea of, let's say, value objects before. Value objects are a way of taking a primitive data type that represents the real underlying identity of an entity inside your system. That primitive data type could be a string or a GUID or an int. And you dress it up inside a wrapper class in order to make sure that you can't accidentally confuse a user ID with a product ID with an order ID, that type of thing. That's one example of making legal states not representable inside your code. In this case, we're going to go ahead and use this little struct I created here, this non-zero unsigned short, to make sure that we comply with a specific piece of requirements that are in the MQTT specification. We're building an MQTT library. We have a number of videos coming out on this Turbo MQTT library project that we're working on. This is a data type that we already have. This is designed to make sure that we can't assign a packet identifier with the value of zero. That's a reserved value, so it's illegal to use inside any packets that require a packet ID. And you can take a look at our actual packet ID base class implementation. This is our MQTT packet with ID base type. Not all MQTT packets require IDs, but the ones that do must use this non-zero unsigned short. If you try to assign zero to this value, you will get an argument out of range exception. That's what the constructor in the previous slide showed. We could also use a Roslyn analyzer to detect when someone's trying to pass in zero to this value and raise a compilation error if we wanted to. That's not something we could normally do at compile time just using vanilla C sharp, but using a custom rule, we could go ahead and do that. That's the general idea behind making illegal states unrepresentable, is we wanna make sure that problems get discovered as soon as possible, and we have confidence that whenever we're doing work inside our application, everything is kosher and all complies with the business rules that we're trying to follow. This is leveraging static typing to go ahead and do all of this. So the next thing we're gonna take a look at real quickly is the problem that we're gonna to try to solve today via a new set of structs that we're gonna introduce. So here's a bug that we have on the Turbo MQTT project. This is a high performance MQTT client for .NET. The problem that we have is that during our benchmarking, we are receiving packet types a client should not receive. In this case, we're receiving a connect packet. This is a packet type a client is supposed to send, not receive. So that's one issue. The other issue is that when we're decoding this packet, we're getting these out of bounds or argument out of range exceptions, which means that it's been either encoded incorrectly or decoded incorrectly. Likewise, if we scroll a bit further down, we have another example I just gathered today where the client received an unsubscribe packet. Again, we shouldn't be receiving these types of packets. Clients send these, they don't receive them. The broker is the one who receives these packets. So we know there's one problem there already. And we predicted this packet was of size 18 bytes, which is a, probably a normal value for, an, for a uh, unsubscribe packet. Well, if we take a look at this exception here, one of the fields on this packet, we expected it to be 12 bytes at least, but instead it was read to be 29,797, which means we definitely have an encoding or a decoding error somewhere inside this packet. We need to get to the bottom of it, and I suspect this error might be coming from our packet size estimator, which is a tool that we use to compute how big a packet's gonna be before we write it out to the wire. This system has been the source of a ton of N plus one errors that have confounded me for hours or days at a time. So I know that code is prone to bugs and errors right now. And I also know that we can just generally do things better without compromising on performance. So let's take a look at the problem space real quickly for what we're trying to solve. So MQTT reasons about data payloads in terms of packets. Uh, there's, you know, let's say about 15 or 16 different packet types, depending on what version of the protocol you're using, but all of them follow this convention. Every packet must be a minimum of two bytes in length. One byte contains the packets type in the control field and also some flags that are important to the control protocol for MQTT. So things like whether or not this message should be retained, whether or not this message is a duplicate, etc. And then the next mandatory byte has to be the remaining length, which describes how big the rest of this packet is. That remaining length is a variable length field. It can be between one to four bytes. 
Our smallest possible packets only require one byte for the remaining length, whereas our bigger packets, such as our published packets, which are, which are where the real payloads are contained, those can have a header length of up to four bytes in length. So this header can be of a variable size, between two to five bytes in length. Our MQTT packet size estimator is responsible for computing how big these two fields are here, the variable header and the payload size. Uh, those can vary in size depending on what packet we're working with and how much content there is to include. So that's what the estimator's job is currently, is to determine how big are these two segments here. It doesn't compute how big the mandatory header is supposed to be, and I suspect that's where we're running into problems. So let's take a look at the source code as it currently stands today. Now, this is a benchmark that we've added because, again, Turbo MQTT is supposed to be a high-performance library. This is our packet size estimator benchmark for the MQTT 3.1.1 implementation that we have. So we have a little enumerable. It's going to return all the different packet types we support for this version of the protocol. So ping, disconnect, connect, uh, publish, publish act, subscribe, have all that in there. We're going to run each one of those packet types through this benchmark right here, where the packet size estimator is going to estimate the packet size and return that as an integer value. If we take a look at this code, basically what we're doing is doing a little switch statement based off of our packet base class it has a little enum that describes what uh, the packet control header includes. So we have connect, conac, publish, all that good stuff. And then we're going to encode these packets to the appropriate size here. We're going to go ahead and say, all right, the packet is going to, you know, basically if it's a sub ACK, we're going to go ahead and compute how big that packet is. I think that can be up to four bytes in length. If it is the connect packet, we're going to go ahead and estimate that it is approximately, you know, going to here. We basically have, let's see, protocol name, version, connect flags, keep alive, and then all the properties right here. So we have a little size estimator, et cetera. We don't need to go into all the details for how all these different packets work. But the point is, we're only supposed to be estimating the size of the body. We're not supposed to compute the size of the length field, which is variable, and we're not supposed to compute the control field either. I suspect we are not doing things in a particularly consistent manner inside this code, and that is what's resulting in some of these bugs appearing inside our test suite. Now, the last thing I want to show real quickly is the packet size estimation benchmark results. These are supposed to be very fast operations, and so you can see here, these are all the different packet types for processing. So, for instance, a, a connect packet right here, this takes 18 nanoseconds for us to encode. And a published packet, if I scroll a little bit further down here, let's see, this is it right here. This is taking about four nanoseconds for us to go ahead and, and encode. All right, so that's all pretty simple by the looks of it. Um, and we wanna try to maintain reasonably good performance, but we wanna try to address these N plus one errors. We suspect that the size of packets as they're currently estimated aren't accurate across the board. So we want to try to develop a new data structure, and we're going to actually break all of our existing code in order to enforce using it across our test suite, our benchmarks, and our actual implementation code. So let's go ahead and design a data structure that should help us do that. So here is what I've come up with. We've created a packet size read-only data struct, and this struct is going to take the content size. This is the value that was originally computed by the packet size estimator. We're gonna take that as a read-only value in our constructor. We're going to assert that this value has to be at least zero. Uh, you can't have a negative length. And then we're going to have a couple of additional properties that are computed on the fly. We don't wanna pre-compute them up front because that's going to make this more expensive. We only wanna compute it on demand whenever it's needed. Performance matters a lot. Even something like summing integers together can actually make an impact if you're doing hundreds of thousands of packets a second. So what we wanna do here is have a little field that will compute the variable length header size. The static method on the MQTT packet size estimator will accurately do this for us. And then we're gonna compute the total length of this packet. That's gonna include the fixed length header, which includes the variable length header size and the size of our content. By breaking these out into their own separate types that are all self-contained inside the struct, this should help reduce the surface area for math errors that we've been making. So given that, let's go ahead and take a look at how we can do this accurately inside our packet size estimator. The first thing we're gonna to need to do is go down to, oh, let me find one of our methods here. Scroll up. Let's see, let's go to this method and we're gonna go ahead and return 
a packet size estimate. And we're also going to return a packet size estimate here. And we're going to have the return a packet size estimate for some of the other properties down below. Now, one thing I'd strongly discourage you from doing is do not add implicits for being able to automatically cast an integer to this. That's going to create a fair amount of, let's say, st stack allocation pressure if you're doing lots of rapid comparisons and that sort of thing. You also don't want to accidentally assign the wrong value. Use the constructor. It'll go ahead and make sure that everything's done very intentionally and you will get the most benefit from this technique if you do it that way. That's something I wish I had not done on my non-zero unsigned short. And I'm going to try to go back and add that later because I think that'll help me make things more performant and make sure I'm doing things more consistently across that code. So do not be tempted to go ahead and do implicit, you know, sort of uh, casting operators on this, on this struct. Uh, just go ahead and use the constructor. Keep it boring. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of compilation errors now. I'm going to go through and try to fix them and see if I can get our unit test suite to pass. So I'll go ahead and get back with you once that's done. So obviously this change has broken a lot of code in a lot of places so far. So I'm not quite done with all of it yet, but I've already found one bug that got fixed. Uh, it wasn't in, in an important area, but nevertheless, still good that I caught it. But you can see here where I have code like this sprinkled everywhere inside my application, where I have to remember to grab the packet length header size and add one and do all that stuff. So we're doing a lot of this arithmetic everywhere inside this application. By changing this particular, this is an Aka Streams uh, graph stage. By changing this graph stage, so we are using this packet size object and we're just computing off the end of it, hey, what's the total size? All those little details around how we do the addition and everything else are now something that's internal and I don't need to have multiple versions of this sprinkled everywhere in all the code that works with these buffers. I'm pretty sure that even if this is, doesn't solve the bug that we're looking for in the open issue, this is going to make it so much easier for us to do more things with packet encoding down the road, especially when we do things like add support for MQTT5, which has a lot more fields and the packets are more complicated than they are in MQTT 3.1.1. So we're definitely on the right track. I'm taking a look at a lot of the code that we're implementing here and I can tell that it's greatly simplifying a lot of the ugly stuff that we've been doing so far in here. So I'm pretty sure we're going to find that even if we don't solve the ultimate bug that we're looking for, it's going to make the experience of working with this code a lot better. All right, so I have a number of, so by the way, I have finished fixing all the breaking uh, compilation changes, so that's all, all working as far as I know. But I have about 11 failed unit tests in my suite here. All of them are concentrated around a small number of packet types, so connect and conac. Okay, so there's probably a common shared problem between those two. And then I also noticed in my decoder spec that we have a bug around handling partial messages. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and pause the camera again. Some of these might be just me messing things up while I was trying to fix the compilation errors. That's okay. That's kind of part of what the investigative process is about. But the fact that I've got two different packet types that have a whole bunch of tests failing tells me that either I had a problem there before that we've now revealed uh, by way of doing this, or I introduced a problem. Uh, I will let you know what I find out as soon as I get done uh, investigating. All right, so I've had a chance to go and work through all the uh, unit tests that we set up. So some of the unit tests were failing, if I go and pull this up here. Some of the unit tests were failing, like these estimating packet size ones. This was failing before because we were just comparing everything to an integer. So once I wrapped that in a packet size object, fluent assertions passed everything, so that's looking good. And the other test that we were working on, it was this partial frame test right here. The issue with this test was just that I needed to recalculate the offsets. This test is designed to simulate what's called a packet fragmentation, which is where you only receive a partial frame from the socket, and you've got to hang on to that partial frame in memory read from the socket again, join those two values to, again, and then decode from there. I just needed to update the way we compute all the artificial frames uh, for testing that. So that's all that code was doing. So there were no real issues found by my test suite at all. And I went ahead and re-ran our end-to-end -end benchmarks and the numbers look good. We were able to go ahead and basically stay in the same ballpark for performance, so that's great. However, one thing I noticed is that we did not have any of the decoding errors that we saw earlier. I think we feed about three to four million packets through this benchmark every single time we run it. And we would normally hit that error at least once. 
uh, per benchmark run. Not for every single one of these individual cases, but one every time we invoked benchmark.net. I've run these benchmarks about 10 times since, and I haven't seen the error show up since we implemented this packet size data structure. And I also went ahead and ran our packet size estimator benchmarks, and these numbers are totally in line as well. So this means that introducing this packet size data structure did not introduce any performance issues at all. So that's great. So we're, we're still high performance, but now we also are much more type safe and less error prone than we were before. Now, if I scroll down to the bottom, I think I may have found where this encoding error was sneaking into our code before. This batch weighted call, this is an ACA stream stage. This is where we compute how many packets to bring into the next stage. And I noticed we were not using the total size before, we were using just the size of the body. This meant that for small packets in particular, we could end up missing maybe as much as half of the payload if we didn't do this correctly. Or we might end up counting the packet as zero length which would mean in turn that we were producing payloads that were larger than the maximum frame size. Now, something inside Turbo MQTT should log an exception if that happens. And apparently maybe that wasn't happening. It's also no accident that we only saw this error occur when we were starting to use larger packet sizes. That would be more prone to trigger this error in our benchmark because once we start working with things like four kilobit and eight kilobit packets, we're much more likely to hit the maximum frame size, which I think is 128 kilobytes versus when we're using 10 or 10 byte or 1K messages. Uh, those are not likely to go ahead and hit the maximum frame size limit. The socket's probably going to finish its reads and writes more quickly. So we're never really going to approach that maximum size, but with bigger payload sizes, we might. So I think this might have been the source of our problem. Uh, we probably need to go and add some more assertion code to make sure we can't hit or exceed the maximum frame. But the reason why this might have contributed to corrupt packets is that it might have left off some of the packets content from the very end. Therefore, when we did the joining of partial frames on the next read in the future, we end up connecting data from one packet with another. And so a coder thinks it's all one packet, but really it's two. So I think that might've been where the error came from. It looks like everything's been resolved. We'll go ahead and continue to test and run it obviously to see if that's the case. But I feel pretty confident that we've used the type system to eliminate this really nasty and brutal error from ever occurring again inside our code. So anyway, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe this video and stay tuned for some of the other videos we're gonna be doing about highperformance.net with the construction of this Turbo MQTT library. Thank you very much.